Hi, in this session we're going to be looking at the triads that form the basis of harmony. And then we're going to work out how we work with the triads to look at a melody that we might want to harmonise. In other words, a melody that we want to choose chords for. So the whole thing sounds good. We've done a bit of this in earlier grades, and uh, if you've come to this afresh, you might want to look back at some of the grades one to five material just to work out what's going on with chords. But I'm gonna start with a brief kind of refresher and we'll move on fairly quickly to see how we're going to do this conversion from working with the triads to actually writing some harmony, which is where music starts to get very exciting. So let's work in the key of C major. And here's a stave. And in order to find the triads for the key of C major, I'm going to begin by writing the scale of C major. So C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Now I could write C at the top in order to complete the scale, but from the point of view of triads, I'll end up with the same triad at the C at the top as I've got at the C at the bottom, so I don't particularly need that top note to work out the triads. Now what I do in order to have the triads is to put the third note and the fifth note above each of these notes. So if C is the first note, here's C, well obviously E is a third above C, and the fifth above C is G. So that's the first triad. Above D I'm going to do the same thing, so a third above D is F, and a fifth above D is A, so I've got what I call a root, a third, and a fifth. On to the next note, which is E. A third above E is G, and a fifth above E is B. So I have a root, which is E, a third, which is G, and a fifth, which is B. Let's carry on. So the next one's F, A, C. Then I have G, B, D. And then we have A, C, E, and B, D, F. And as I said before, if I had C at the top of the scale, I'd have C, E, G, which is just the same as C, E, G down here, which is why I don't need to repeat it. When it comes to labelling these triads, the convention is to do this using Roman numerals. So, if you see Roman numerals, you know you're talking about triads or chords. First degree of the scale, number one. Second degree of the scale, number two. The third one, number three. And number four, number five, number six, and number seven. So now we've got the triads on each degree of the scale. Now, we're going to make a pretty big step fairly quickly, because underneath these triads, I've written a melody in the key of C major, and we're going to try to work out how we can use these triads to give us some harmony, some chords that fit with that melody. Now, obviously, you can do this by a kind of trial and error. You could fiddle about at the piano or a keyboard and try and find a chord that you think you like the sound of that fits these notes but you'll see that there's a clear system behind this. Let's begin straight away with the first note of the melody. Now the first note of this melody is C. So what we've got to do is to find a chord that contains C. And you'll find that there will always be three chords with any given note in them. How does that work? Well, C is the root of chord one. C is the third of chord six. And C is the fifth of chord four. So that's telling me that if I'm trying to harmonize the note C, I could use chord one, or I could use chord four, or I could use chord six. They'll always sound good. They'll always sound what we call consonant, 
because C is a member of those three chords, but C is not in these other chords. So if you wanted to choose chord seven, for example, it wouldn't sound so good because there is no C in chord seven. So let's have a think about this. If I've got this first note C, that's the C in the melody, let me just take this triad an octave lower for the time being. It doesn't matter which octave we hear them in. If I play the triad for chord one, with this C in the melody, you can hear that that sounds fine, doesn't it? Because C is at the bottom of that triad for chord one. If I decided to go for a chord four, here's the triad for four, F, A, and C, and I've got C in the melody, you can also hear that that sounds good. So one sounds good, four sounds good. And we also said that C appears in chord six. Well, there's chord six, A, C, and E. And you can hear that that sounds good too. So one, four, six. Those three chords all fit. However, let's go for chord seven. If I put chord seven down, B, D, F, and then I put C on the top, you can immediately hear that that is a dissonant sound because C is not a member of chord seven. I'm not saying you should never use it, you may like the sound of that, but in conventional harmony we wouldn't really do that because C doesn't belong to any of those notes in chord seven. So, whenever you're harmonising a note, you'll always find three chords that will fit it and you have to make your choice. Now, you'll notice certain other things, like, for example, chords one, four, and five in a major key are always major chords. Chords two, three, and six are minor chords. Chord seven is slightly unusual because it's a diminished chord. So you may think, well, actually, at this particular point in the piece, I'd like to use a major chord or I'd like to use a minor chord. In the case of one, four, and six that fit this first note, one, four are major chords, six is a minor chord. So you may decide that the mood dictates that you want to have a major chord or a minor chord. That might be one of the issues. The reason why I'm going to select chord one for this first note is because it's the first note of a piece of music in C major. So it's the clearest thing to do. If I use chord one, I'm really making it very clear that my piece of music is in the key of C major. If I use chord four, F, A, C, and I begin my piece of music with a chord four, it may sound like a chord four in C major, but it might also sound like a chord one in F major, because if you think about it, the first degree of the scale of F major is F. And if I build chord one, I'd have F, A, and C. So it was the very first sound that I heard in this piece. I might be tempted to think that I'm listening to a piece of music in F major. Or if I use chord six, A, C, and E is obviously chord six in C major, but it's also chord one in A minor. So if this was the first thing I heard, I might be tempted to think that I'm hearing a piece of music in A minor. So I want to make the key as clear as possible. And that's why I've decided to go for a chord one in C major for my first chord. So here it is, there's the first note C, and here's the chord C, E, and G. Now what we're going to do in the case of this particular piece is we're going to write four part harmony. In other words, we've talked in earlier lessons in grades one to five about having four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So we're going to think in those terms. And the first thing you might decide is, well, how do we write in four parts when we've only got three notes? No harm in using one of those notes more than once, as long as we're using those notes C, E, and G. So for example, in the first chord, I could decide I'm going to have C, in the bass, G in the tenor, and E in the alto part. So I've used these notes C, E, and G, C, top and bottom, E in the alto, G in the tenor. 
So I've taken this basic triad, chord one, C, E, G, and I've used those three notes, and I've just spread them out a bit. So that's the first chord that I've written. But there's no reason to say that you couldn't organize that chord in some other way. I can take the notes of chord one, and I can organize them like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, or like this. They're all different versions of the same thing. I'm still using those notes C, E, and G. Okay, so that's given us an option on the first chord, which there isn't too much discussion about really, because it's the first chord in a piece of music in the key of C major. So chord one makes sense. Okay, let's move on now to the next chord, because we have a G in the melody. And we can play the same little trick again. We can look at which three chords contain the note G. Well, G is obviously the root of a chord five. G is also the middle of chord three, and G is also the top of chord one. Now, I might at this point mention that there's a kind of hierarchy of chords. Chords one, four, and five are what we call the primary triads. They're the ones that are most likely to be used. Chords two, three, and six are what we call the secondary triads. In the case of a major key, you'll notice the primary triads are the major chords, one, four, and five. The secondary triads are the minor chords, two, three, and six. And chord seven is a diminished chord, which some people think just sounds a little bit ugly. It's certainly a little bit uncomfortable. So generally speaking, at the moment at least, seven is probably worth avoiding. The next least likely chord that gets used in the hierarchy of things is chord three. There's nothing wrong with poor old chord three. It's just that it's rather unusual. So seven is perhaps the least likely chord to be used, and three is the next chord that's least likely to be used. I'm not dismissing it at all, and there's some wonderful opportunities to use a chord three, but it's not going to be your first port of call. So we're looking at a note now which has got G in it, and G is in chord three. So maybe for the time being, we'll forget chord three, but we could decide that we're either gonna go for a chord five or a chord one. Well, what would that sound like? Here's a G. If I put chord five under it, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? If I put chord one under it, that sounds pretty good as well. So I could say, well, I've already had chord one here, so do I want to use another chord one straight after it? Or might it be a better idea to use a chord five? That would be perfectly logical. Another solution, just to point this out, is that we could use chord one again, but we could use it in a different inversion. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Just for argument's sake we'll do this so we can explore this possibility. I'm going to choose for the second chord, chord 1B. Now what this means is I'm going to use the notes of chord 1, C, E and G. If C is the lowest sounding note, in other words it's the note that's in the bass part, then I say I'm using chord one in root position. And I call that chord one A. If I just call it one, I assume I'm talking about one A. If I use the note C, E, G, but E is the lowest note, E is in the bass, then I say I'm using chord one in first inversion. And I call that one B. If I use chord one and I put G in the bass, then I say I'm using chord one in second inversion, and I call it one C. I have to say that second inversion is the least likely thing you're going to meet. You will meet it, but it's not terribly common. So you're much more likely to live in a world of root position chords, A chords, and first inversion chords, B chords. So for argument's sake here, let's use one B and just work out what that might look like. Well, it's going to have an E in the bass, otherwise it's not going to be a first inversion chord. 
Let's maybe repeat the G in the tenor and drop down to a C in the alto part. So you can see I've used the same chord again, but I've gone into first inversion, a 1B chord, and I've just kind of reorganized things a bit. So the first chord sounds like this, and the second chord sounds like this. And you can hear there's a progression. It's the same chord, it's still chord one, but because it's gone into first inversion, there's a progression. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Here's an A. Now remember how this works. A is going to be the root of one chord, it's going to be the third of another chord, and it's going to be the fifth of another chord. Let's see if we can work out what's going on. A, you'll notice, is the root of chord six. A is also the third of chord four, and A is also the fifth of chord two. You might be already establishing that there's a pattern here. Do you see if it's the root of this chord, it will be the third of the chord that's two behind it, and it will be the fifth of the chord that's two behind that. So if it's the root of six, you know it's going to be the third of four, and it's going to be the fifth of two. If it's the root of seven, it will be the third of five, and it will be the fifth of three. You just go back two chords each time to find the next chord. It just speeds up the process. So this could be chord six, it could be chord four, or it could be chord two. And really, within reason, it doesn't matter which you use, and you may just decide to play with the sound of those chords to see what you fancy. I've got A in the top there. If I put chord six, it sounds like this. Six, of course, is a minor chord. If I use chord four, that's going to give me a major chord. If I use chord two, that's going to give me a minor chord. So you've got three different sounds, six, four, and two. And you have to try and work out not only what that sounds like, but what it sounds like as a progression from the previous chord. And again, you can just sit and experiment with that. For argument's sake, I'm going to choose chord four. It's not the only option, but I'm going to go for a chord four. So here's chord four, F, A, and C. I think at the moment I'm going to use it in its root position. So it's a four A chord, and I'm going to have to have F in the bass if I'm going to use it in root position. So there's an F. And let's just see what we're going to do with the other part. So say we have an F in the alto part and a C in the tenor part, then we've used these notes F, A, C, and we've spread that into a four-part chord. Well, it's getting quite exciting now. We're beginning to put this piece together. How do the first three chords progress? Here's chord one, followed by one B, followed by chord four. Sounds quite good, doesn't it? Now, let's move on to the fourth beat. I've purposely just made this a little bit more complicated by putting these two quavers in. One temptation is to say, well, I need to have one chord for the G, and then I'll need to have another chord for the F. But that would make the rate of chord change rather quick. You know, if we have one chord on this quaver, then another chord on the next quaver, the chords are going to change very quick, and that could actually sound a little bit kind of agitated in the music. It's possible that the note in the melody belongs to a chord. It's also possible that some notes are what we call inessential notes. And we talked about those when we did some work on grade five theory. We talked about passing notes, notes that pass by step between two notes that have chords. So in other words, the G could have a chord and this E could have a chord. And this F just passes by step between the G and the E, so we could just call that a passing note. We could also have other forms of what we call inessential notes, auxiliary notes. A lower auxiliary note is simply when I have a note that has a chord, and then I go down a note and come back to the previous note again. So this could have a chord, that could just be a lower auxiliary note, and this could come back to the chord. Or I could go C, D, C, and in that case the D would be an upper auxiliary note, so the C would have a chord, the D would just go up one, 
and we come back to C with a chord again. So um, that would be an auxiliary note. I can also have things like anticipatory notes. Let's say I have a, a D followed by a C. The D has a chord, it could be this chord. And the C has a chord, it could be this chord. But then if I do this, you can hear that this C anticipates the next C. So the first C is an anticipatory note. So these notes could be harmony notes because they have a chord that belongs to them, or some of them might be inessential notes, passing notes, auxiliary notes, or anticipatory notes. I'm going to suggest for a moment that this G has a chord and that the F is a passing note. It's just passing between the G and the E. So let's find a chord that fits the G. Let's play that little trick again that we did a few moments ago. G is the root of chord five. Go back two chords and you find G is the third of chord three. Go back two chords and you find that G is the fifth of chord one. So the options for this G are five or three or one. Well, we've had two chord ones, so maybe we don't want to go there again. We said that chord three is the least likely chord to be used after chord seven, so maybe the most obvious thing to do is to go for a chord five. So let's do that. Let's put G in the bass because that's the root of five. So I'm going to use chord five and I'm going to call it five A, five in root position. And then let's just get some other notes that belong to the chords because if the chord is G, B, D, I've got G in the bass and at the top, B in the tenor and D in the alto. Okay, now then let's go on to the next one. Here's an E. So E is what? It's the root of chord three. E is the middle of chord one. It's the third of chord one. And E is the fifth of chord six. It's possible that I'm coming towards the end of my first phrase. Maybe this piece of music has got a couple of two bar phrases, which means I also need to think about something called a cadence. Remember, we talked about cadences again in grade five theory, a perfect cadence is where you have chord five followed by chord one, a plagal cadence is chord four followed by chord one, an imperfect cadence is any chord followed by five, it's normally one to five, two to five, or four to five, and an interrupted cadence, which you didn't need to know for grade five, goes chord five followed by chord six. Let's just do those again. Perfect cadence is five to one, five, one. You can hear it's the end of something, that progression. A plagal cadence is four to one. Four to one. An imperfect cadence is something to five, and it's normally one to five. Here it comes. One to five. Or it's four to five. Or it's two to five. And an interrupted cadence is five to six. Five, six. And previously we suggested that the perfect cadence and the plagal cadence might be cadences that you regard as full stop cadences. They're the end of something, perfect cadence. Feels as if we're home and dry, plagal cadence. We've been brought to the end of something. An imperfect cadence feels more like a kind of musical question mark finish something but uh, we're not kind of there. No, sorry I said a question mark but more like a musical comma. So in other words we're at the end of something but we're not completely at the end. So one to five or four to five or two to five they feel more like musical commas. Now the question mark is the interrupted cadence. You get a chord five and then you think it might be followed by a chord one case it would be perfect but when you get five and it's followed by a chord six oh that's a little bit of a surprise isn't it so that feels more like a sort of musical question mark if you like but when we come to the end of a phrase we're trying to use these cadence formulas <laughs> 
We've had chord five there, so if we have chord one here, then we're going to make a perfect cadence. Is that going to work? Oh yes, E belongs to chord one. And actually, so does G. So there's no reason, because we're at a cadence point, why we couldn't now decide that instead of having to have a chord on every single beat of the bar, we're going to have a moment of repose for the cadence and just have a chord one. C, E and G. E is in that chord, G is in that chord. So that's actually rather useful, isn't it? So I could do something like this, for example. Maybe have a, a semi-brief in the bass part there and I could arrange the chord like this. So I've got a C, another C in the alto, E at the top, G in the tenor, and then I could just move to a slightly different arrangement of the same chord by doing something like this. I could repeat the C in the bass or just leave it as it is. So I've now got a first phrase that sounds like this. <laughs> So, let's now move on to the second phrase and see if we can continue in the same vein. Now, the first thing you might notice about the beginning of this second phrase is that we've got another pair of quavers. And we had some quavers back here, didn't we? And we said that we didn't really want to have a chord on each quaver. It's always perfectly possible, but if I have a chord on each quaver, it's going to sound a little bit hassled. You know, if I'd done a chord on each of these quavers, I'd have got something like this. Which is very fast moving for the harmony. Much smoother to do what we did. Because you just hear this passing note glide between these two melody notes, but the chords are not moving too quickly. So sometimes that's the answer when you see quavers in a melodic line to wonder if each of those quavers really needs a new chord or really whether you might be dealing with one of these inessential notes. So if you see quavers or even something more complicated, semi-quavers, triplets, you might just consider the possibility that something is an inessential note. Now if we look at this little corner at the beginning of the second phrase, we have a note it goes down one and then it comes back to the same note again. Now that suggests that this G could be what we call a lower auxiliary chord, a lower auxiliary note. And the important thing is that the inessential notes, the passing notes, the auxiliary notes, the anticipatory notes, those notes do not need to belong to the chord because they're inessential. They don't they're not essential to the chord, that's why we call them inessential notes. So I could find a chord that fits with the A and a chord that fits with this A. It could be the same chord, or I could have one chord for this A and a different chord for this A, that doesn't matter. But I can treat this G as a lower auxiliary note. So let's go about it in that sort of way and see where we get to. So we're looking for a chord that's got A in it. Now, A is the root of chord six. Let's play the trick we played earlier. Skip back two chords. We find that A is the middle of chord four. It's the third of chord four. Slip back two chords again, and we discover that A is at the top of chord two. It's the fifth of chord two. So we could go for a six or a four or for a two. Now, just to make life interesting, instead of using the same chord twice, maybe we could use two of those chords. So out of the six or the four or the two, well, we could use any of those, couldn't we? For the, for the moment, let's make a choice and start with a chord four and move on to a chord two. OK, so that's going to give me an F in the bass here and it's going to give me a D in the bass for the next chord. Then I just need to work out some other chords that belong, some other notes that belong to those chords to fill in the missing part. So if I've got chord four, F, A, C, I've got an F in the bass, I've got an A at the top, well, I'm going to need a C somewhere, aren't I? So maybe I could put that in the 
tenor part. And maybe I'll just double up the F in the alto part for now. So that's given me a chord four to fit with that A at the top. And I'm going to go on to a chord two. So what do I need in chord two? D, F and A. Well, we have a D at the bottom. We've got an A at the top. So let's put an F in the alto part and we've taken care of that missing note. And well, maybe just double up the D in the tenor part. Now, have a little listen to that progression going from four to two with a lower auxiliary note. See how that works? And you can see, you can hear that the G is an inessential note. That G doesn't actually belong to that chord four, doesn't belong to the chord two either. But the two A's are harmony notes. This A belongs to this chord four, this A belongs to that chord two. So it's just quite interesting to treat the G as a lower auxiliary note. Now say I decided to harmonise this G with a chord of its own, so I could treat this as a harmony note. I could have done something like I could have gone four, five, two, but can you hear that it all sounds a bit of a dash? To use that as opposed to which just kind of glides through the phrase a little bit more comfortably. Okay, let's go on and see what we're going to do next. And just to show you other possibilities, let's look at this G, and I've got an idea in mind for it already. There's G. G is the root of chord five, so therefore it must be the third of chord three, and it must be the fifth of chord one. Well, I'm gonna suggest we use chord one. We've had a one and we've had a one B. I'm gonna suggest we actually use a chord one C. Now then, if we're going to use one C, that means we're going to use these notes C, E, G, but we have to put G in the bass. Let's just do that for a moment. And I should say at this point that um, second inversion chords, these C chords, are quite rare. They tend to belong to certain progressions. And if you have a 1C chord, it's usually followed by a chord 5. Now you'll hear why this is a minute. If I play a chord 1C, there's a chord 1C. You can hear it's using these notes C, E and G from chord 1, but it's got the 5th in the bass, so there's my 1C. You might be able to hear that that chord is not quite as stable as a chord 1A. One in root position, C, E, G with C in the bass. It's not quite as stable as a 1B chord, where you have C, E, G, but with the E in the bass, the third in the bass. Here's the 1C chord, slightly less stable. And can you feel that it's kind of pulling in a particular direction? So when I have a 1C chord, it sort of pulls me onto this. You can feel that, can't you? There's a kind of tension about the 1C chord, and it pulls me onto a chord 5. So quite often you'll find when you have a chord 1C, it will be followed by a chord 5. Here's 1C, followed by a 5. And it might then stop there, it might be some kind of imperfect cadence that just goes 1C to 5, and that might be the end of the phrase. Or it might go 1C, resolve on to five, and then it might finish on a chord 1A. So those are possibilities for a 1C, that we go 1C to five, or we go a step further, go 1C to five to one. And the other most common second inversion chord, this C chord, is a 4C. When you have something like this, here's 4C in C major, chord four is F, a and C. So if I organise that with the C in the bass, I'll have a 4C chord. That's what 4C sounds like. And that has a pull onto this. So when you write a chord 4C, 4C quite often pulls you onto 
chord one, because I've now got the notes C, B, e, and G. Can you hear how that works? Here's the four C, and it's pulling me towards chord one. And those, to be honest, are the most common uses of second inversion chords. One C that's followed by five, or four C that's followed by one. I'm not saying you won't meet other second inversion chords, because you may well, but they'll be far less common than those particular uses. So I just wanted to use a 1C chord at this point to show the possibility of dealing with a second inversion chord. There's no reason why you couldn't have used a chord 5 or a chord 3. Remember, we said that chord 3 is not terribly common, so that might have been a less likely option than a chord 5. But a chord 1C is another distinct possibility. Now you may be asking, well, okay, well, you've used a chord 1C, but you didn't use 1C back here, you use 1 there, 1 there, 1B there. So why use 1C at this point? Well, because we are approaching the final cadence. And remember what I said a moment ago, that 1C is often followed by 5, and that sometimes it goes 1C to 5, and then it goes on to 1. Well, if it's possible for this piece to finish by going 1C, 5, 1, that would give us that progression. So if you're ever looking at the last three chords of something and you think, well, actually, it could finish by going 5 followed by 1, then it's possible that it might go 1C followed by 5 followed by 1. That will not work in every case, but sometimes it does. So I've just gone for the 1C there, and I'm rather hoping that we're going to be able to finish by going 1C to 5 at least, and then possibly onto chord one. Let's see if we've got any chance of making that work. Well, if we're going to use chord five next, then five is G, B, and D. Well, you might think we're a bit snookered now because actually the note we're dealing with is A. Well, A does not belong to chord five, does it? G, B, and D, there's no A in there at all. So maybe the theory that I've just suggested is really a bit flawed. But all is not lost, because it's possible that this A is a passing note. Can you see it's passing by step between G and the B that follows it? So this could be a passing note, in which case I'm looking for a chord that harmonizes with a B. Let's just go back to chord five for a moment. G, B, and D, aha. So all is well, because I can use a chord five here that I can treat the A as a passing note. Let's just do that, and then I want to say one more thing about it. Um, if we're going to have a chord five, then we need G in the bass. We had this G in the bass, so we could simply repeat that G, or just to make life a bit more interesting, I could drop the G to an octave below. So let's just do that for now, just to make life a little bit more interesting. Um, we better just put some notes in to finish up this 1C chord that came previously. So there it goes. Chord 1, remember, is C, E, G. So I've got a C in the tenor, I've got an E in the alto, and I've got two Gs for the soprano and the bass part. So that's used up all of those quite happily, isn't it? Um, now, Let's move on and do about this chord five for a moment. And I'm going to suggest another little thought as well. That maybe we do this. Now you might be thinking, that's a bit strange, because chord five is G, B and D, and we've just used an F in the alto. So what have I done there? I've added an F on the top of chord five. What this means is I now have a root, a third, a fifth, and I have a seventh. And we'll come back and say a little bit more about seventh chords in the not too distant future. But it's perfectly possible to do that to a chord. You take the basic triad with its root, its third and its fifth, and you add a seventh. And I have to say, that's most likely to happen when you're dealing with a chord five. It's also very possible that you're going to have that situation when you deal with the chord two. 
that you might have D, F, A with C at the top to make number two into a seventh chord. But five seven is the most common, and the next most common is two seven. You can have a seventh on any other chord, but it's rather less likely. So just so we can see how this might work out, let's, instead of just using a chord five, use a chord five seven. You see how I managed to notate that? I used the five in Roman numerals, and then I just put a little seven alongside it, just to make sure we know why this F is in the alto, because this F is the seventh of a five seven. Okay, now you'll notice as well in this chord, you might now be looking at it saying, well, that's all very well, but you've got two G's in the chord. You've got the B here. Now you've put this F in, but where's the D? There's no D. Well, actually, it's possible in some situations to leave out the fifth of a triad. Most of the time it will be there, but it's not absolutely essential, especially when you get into dealing with seventh chords. You definitely need a root, you definitely need a third, and you definitely need a seventh, otherwise it won't be a seventh chord. But the fifth is the note that's sometimes optional. So just to show that that's possible, I've done that here. So you can begin to see how this all now belongs to chord 5-7. There's the G, the B is here, remember. I decided I'm not going to use the fifth in this case, and I've got the F, the seventh, in the alto part. Just before we move on to the last bar, another quick word about this passing note. We've now used a passing note here, and we also used a passing note back here. Now you might be reflecting on that and thinking, well, isn't there a slight difference? At one level there isn't a difference. This is going by step, isn't it? I had a G here, the A is just going up a note onto the B, so that A is just going by step between the G and the B. Back here, I had a situation where I had a G, the F moves by step onto the E, so it's the passing note between G and F. But there is one difference. Back here, the G is on the beat where this chord 5 occurs, and the F gets tucked in on the quaver after the beat. It's on the last half beat of the bar, isn't it? So the G is a harmony note, the F is an inessential note, the passing note, the G comes on the beat and the F comes after the beat. Whereas here, it's the other way around. The A comes on the beat, followed by the B on the half beat later. So the B is the harmony note and the A is the inessential note. Now, we have to just define passing note a step further. When this harmony note here comes on the beat and the F comes in as a passing note just after the beat, we can say it's an unaccented passing note. It's not accented, it just comes after, it's tucked in after. But if the passing note comes on the beat, then we have to say it's an accented passing note. And it's always stronger. Accented passing notes are always stronger than unaccented passing notes. So listen to this one again. Here's the unaccented passing note. And this is the accented passing note. You can hear that that's quite strong accented passing note. So going from the previous chord as opposed to this one from the previous chord where the unaccented passing note is a bit gentler. And the later one. So an accented passing note will always be stronger. But it does give you that option to consider if things are moving by step, and maybe you've got a quaver somewhere in the mix, that one of those quavers might be a passing note. It's then just a question of deciding whether it's an accented passing note or an unaccented passing note. OK, let's see if we can finish the last bar. Well, we said that we know about this progression that goes 1C to 5 to 1. In this case, it might be 1C, 5, 7 to one. So 
we could now simply go on and write a chord one in the last bar. That would be fine, wouldn't it? Could we do anything a little bit more interesting than that? Well, how about this other second inversion that I was talking about a moment ago? I said that the other one that's most likely to be used is a 4C. So maybe we could use a 4C and follow that with a 1. Let's see if that works. I've got two C's in the melody. Well, C is the fifth of a chord four, and C is obviously the root of a chord one. So it's possible, isn't it, that I could do this, where we end up with a C in the bass. Either I can have a semi-brief C, or I can write two minims, that's okay. And then maybe I could put an F in the alto, and an A in the tenor, and then we could just use an E there and a G there. So all these notes belong to chord four. I've got F, A, and two Cs. But because I've put the C in the bass, the fifth in the bass, this is now a chord four C. And then on the next C here, I'm using a chord one, C, E, and G. I've got C in the bass and C at the top in the soprano. I've got an E in the alto and a G in the tenor. So what does that sound like? Let's think about the 4C followed by the 1. Here's the 4C followed by the 1. Now let's look at this progression. 1C, 5, 7, 4C, 1. It goes like this. 1C, 5, 7, 4C, and then chord 1. So really what I'm trying to do here is just unpack how we would go from forming the triads in the key of the piece of music in which we want to work, and then how do we convert those triads into chords that are going to fit that melody. And we've seen that we've a range of possible options. We've always got three chords that will fit any given note. And at first you may just want to try and sit at a keyboard or an other instrument where you could find those chords and just work out the sound of the chords and think which one sounds better than another one. You might think about this business of major chords and minor chords. You might certainly think about trying to avoid chord seven for the time being because that's a slightly awkward customer and we'll come back to that later because it's diminished. You might just think about avoiding chord three at the moment because it's less likely to be used. But after that, you're going to live in a world that's basically root position chords with an occasional first inversion chord like we had here. And you might just think about some of these little tricks like the 1C5 or the 1C51, or in this case, we've just complicated it a bit further by going 1C and instead of using 5, we've used 5, 7. And then we slipped in a 4C to a 1 at the end. I mean, that's quite a combination of events, but it's just there to show you the possibility. Now, what does this thing actually sound like now we've written it? Here it is. <laughs> sounds quite conventional, doesn't it? But you can see how those melody notes fit these chords. You can also see that we've got a kind of expectation in the rate of chord change. And the frequency of chord change is what we call the harmonic rhythm. And basically in this piece of music you can see that most of the harmonic rhythm goes in crotchets. We have a chord on the first crotchet, another on the second crotchet, another on the third crotchet, another on the fourth crotchet. We've got the same thing here. There's one chord for every crotchet beat of the bar. This bar, the harmonic rhythm slows down as it often does for cadences. And in fact here, we've just got one chord that fills up the whole bar. So the harmonic rhythm there has gone from crotchets to a semi-brief. In the last bar, the harmonic rhythm has turned into two minims. So you might expect the harmonic rhythm to slow down at cadence points a little bit. That's one thing that quite often happens. Then after that, 
you can see we've got a kind of balance of chords. We might expect to have more primary chords than anything else. One, four, and five. One, one, four, five, one, four. Well, there's our first secondary chord, a chord two. Back to one, back to five, back to four, back to one. So all but one chord are primary chords. Um, to make it less boring, we've had the odd inversion using primary chords. So a 1B there, a 1C there, a 4C there. So we're not always in root position. And then we've just got that one secondary chord there. We could go a bit further. We could spruce this thing up by saying, is there any opportunity for any other inessential notes? For example, when you look at the bass at the beginning, we go from C to E. Well, we could slip in a passing note. So we go C, D, E. <laughs> Or we could even put one on the alto, E, D, C. Could be either, couldn't it? But just to make life a bit more interesting, let's slip a passing note into the bass. And you can see it's an unaccented passing note. It's coming between the beats. It's coming after this beat. But it just gives us a little bit of movement there. Instead of just having this, we've now got... So whenever you've got a part that's moving by a third, you might think, is there an opportunity to slip in a passing note? If you've got a note that's repeated, you might consider the possibility of an upper or lower auxiliary note. So for example, the next opportunity is this the alto here. How about I slip in a passing note there between the F and the D? That would make life a bit more interesting, wouldn't it? Um, I could decide I'm going to do something like a passing note in the alto there. Sometimes these things work better than others. You'll have to decide in the context of the moment. Um, in this case, I could even have a passing note in the bass here at the same time as I've got a lower auxiliary note going on in the soprano part. So that's another possibility, isn't it? So just by adding those few inessential notes, I've now got this. <laughs> just spruces things up a little bit. So I hope you can see how we got from there to here as a first step in writing your own harmony. Good luck as you set about taking on that challenge. It's great fun and deeply rewarding stuff to do.